Horus in Chess Home Series Reaction, this is Hell Devils 2 is an amazing live service when it wants to be. Watch out, Bricky. Yes, Bricky is making Hell Devils 2 video. Hell Devils 2 is like one of those games that just like catches on, right? I was I constantly see videos about people posting things about Hell Devils 2. Now, what I'm pretty sure it was a Maxer video where I actually watch how Hell Devils 2 is. Uh, you know, the games like this, I think the first game I can think, think of is like Unreal Tournament 2004, right? Uh, it's a simple shooter, like, and it has a certain type of setup. But it's just made in a way that you can feel the story, right? In this, there is a story it's about how you like go to planets, right? Different type of terrains and planets and you tackle that. And you, you think that it's very simplistic, but the way that they have implemented, it just feels like... Uh, you know, there's a, uh, there is some kind of a thing going on, right? It's like a, you know, like storytelling type of way, which is weird. Unreal Tournament 2004 was similar to me because I constantly read about characters, backstories and things. I read about like, uh, you know, maps, backstories and realized, wait a minute, uh, you know, Zen Krieger, you know, his predecessor was Axon. Axon is not even part of his team. Apparently you can take him if you, uh, you know, challenge him to deathmatch or whatever that is. And you can have Axon in, in your team. He was the original. There's so many backstories in Unreal Tournament 2004, right? So th this feels similar to that. Every time you see it, and obviously it's multiplayer, people doing shenanigans and things, right? People fighting, uh, you know, like just doing all the crazy shit. All the game mechanics, right? Uh, explosion and shit, the, you know, fire and the, the, how the smoke looks. So the game is awesome. So, Brick, you know, Brick is great at things like that. Brick reviews many different types of things. Whenever he reviews like certain things like, you know, Warhammer or some good games, it's always awesome. The summer is on its way, and it's now time to do all of the wonderful things we love to do during the summer. Go outside, touch grass, and do everything that doesn't involve taking way too much time to... Yes, <laughs> summer is already here in India. Apparently, it's 40 degrees Celsius, so there you go cook a bunch of meals for your events and Factor can help you out with that. Our sponsor Factor has incredible meals and is the best meal service I have ever used. The flavors are great. All the nutrition facts are laid out easy to see and they have tons of choices to fit your goals this summer. It is everything from breakfast to dessert, low-cal, bulking, protein, keto, it doesn't matter. It's there for you. They also have a ton of other wonderful options like like protein shakes, juices, wellness shots, and more. In the summer, it's time to do more of the things you love and less of that that you don't. And so Factor can help you out with that, with its excellent meals and time saving. Yeah, most of your body is water, glucose. So keto, no carb diet is insane. I don't know how people are like just obviously human body would adjust to that, but that's just insane strategies so go on and head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code bricky50 to get 50 percent off your first factor box and 20 percent off your next month of orders that's code bricky50 at factor75.com to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next month of orders thank you so much for sponsoring this video and let's get on with the content but freedom doesn't come free <laughs> <laughs> Sweet liberty! Let me tell you, there's nothing that really warms my heart than completing an entire video script and then only finding out that the company has shot themselves in the foot, basically during the entire editing process. We spend genuine weeks creating a video discussing why Helldivers has done what so many games haven't done before, utilizing their live service and how it is so much better than the rest, and then I immediately age like milk. For the uninitiated, it would appear that PlayStation Network is requiring you to sign into Helldivers going forward forward in order to play the game even if you do not have a playstation if you are on steam you require a psn account now a large majority of this video Hold up that how does that make sense i mean when you when you make a windows account because there's many windows things that are right like like pc is windows right so it's not just about xbox that makes sense but psn is just about playstation like they don't have windows type operating system for pc and things like that so if you're not on PlayStation, what's the point of making PlayStation account? But no, you still have to make it. That's just like, there's no sense there, right? And, you know, I don't have a really good uh, experience when it comes to, like, PlayStation accounts. Because I'm pretty sure my original one long time ago when I had PlayStation 4 somehow got stolen with all the games in it. Even, even, even with all the password and all the shit, right? All the, like, uh, you know, security things that were, somehow it got stolen.
video will be said before all of this kind of stuff and unfortunately will definitely feel perhaps mildly dated when it comes to the situation but i do think that the discussion on the ah, live service fun. aspects okay. of the game are not generally affected by this change from sony what helldivers does well in terms of how it does content has nothing to do with this psn thing even if it is and i use this scientifically a bit shit however this is too important a discussion that we cannot simply ignore it we will come back to this later on in the video Hello again! Let me clarify the situation in a little more detail regarding owners of the EOD version and access to the cooperative mode and also other issues. First of all, PvE game mode. This is not DLC. <laughs> DLC, in our understanding, is the major additions to the game, including various functionality and content that are released after the official release of the game as themed DLC pack. <laughs> We observe your dissatisfaction and have decided that the functionality of the PvE mode will be available for free to all owners of the EOD version of the release of the game. Now you have the opportunity to test this mode by purchasing the Unheard edition of the game. This is it for now. Please share your thoughts. Thank you. Helldivers 2 had all the signs of being a, just a quick flash in the pan and then fading into relative success, but not astronomical player counts. It's very rare that any game can hit over 400,000 concurrent players and maintain that for all the normal reasons, like players wanting to move on to something else. I would have been completely fine with Helldivers getting its massive success and then going down to a concurrent of around 40,000 zing and maintaining a solid community. But now, right now, the game still has maintained a 24 hour peak on Steam of just under 200,000 players, which is absolutely phenomenal for the title. A lot of buzz has been thrown around discussing how the game does its live service aspect. And I myself have wanted to just, you know, throw my hat Wait a minute, is a few hundred thousand considered good when it, in today's world at this scale? Because I'm pretty sure like, you know, like a few million or something, that, that was the thing like, okay, we have this many active. Even with Fallout 76, I'm pretty sure like, you know, the thought was like kind of boasting, we have like a million plus players, this and that. Even this was when people were just like not playing Fallout 76. So is 200,000 considered good? Because I'm pretty sure Helldivers 2 has become this, like I constantly see videos, right? It's not like I've watched Helldivers 2 videos, right? I just saw a Maxer one and I'm watching this one. And some of the entire homepage is like Helldivers 2, Helldivers 2, people are doing shit in that. So clearly it's a famous game now into the ring as i have been somewhat vocal on my annoyance for corporate video game greed but also understanding the sheer cost it takes to make these products for a game like helldivers to succeed it has to be more than just a good game that might seem like a strange thing to gloss over as being a good game is the most fundamental part of any kind of game success even and if the, the dead by daylight this. players might take issue with that <laughs> But to interrogate this point further, we need to discuss what making a video game is like in 2024. Now, I am an online video game reviewer slash discussion flesh brick man. I do not know the deep inner workings of game development from a technical He's sense, but from a financial sense, videos. there's a lot I've learned over my years. Three whole caramel apples is not yeah, enough to podcast, right? reach he the difference. And if I were to buy a fourth caramel apple, it would basically equivalent the costs or be equivalent of the cost of the apple now in general in order to make a game that is profitable there are a lot of factors that need to come into play at one time right now there's an interesting lull in the video game space between all the various types of ratings right now the triple a space is looking to sort of just implode on itself there's a general metric for determining costs of game development normally you think about 100,000 a year per person this is very generalist and not perfect at all but say you have a double a game studio of about 30 people that's three million dollars a year in salary alone you know a few people slightly under 100k decent amount over depending on how good your talent is and how greedy your higher ups are say your game takes five years to make therefore that's 50 million dollars probably add another million to be safe for i mean i don't know man look bethesda games to games all of it before fallout 4 
was like what 40 50 people i'm pretty sure like 40 60 people that's that's all they were right and every single one game of the year like best seller of all time they were all considered triple a right from oblivion morrowind even fallout 3 skyrim they were all like 50 60 people as far as i remember so that's if, if anything like oh that's kind of like indie scale but it's i think it's like more of like their main parent studio they had the biggest budget or something right so it's considered triple a in that way I think that's what it is, like, how much budget you have, uh, like, considering everything else, right? Uh, obviously, the technology changes, so budget of 10 years ago would co be considered today, like, double-A level of thing. But I'm pretty sure it's based on budget or something. Because Outer Worlds, I hated the game at first because I never went past the first map. But one day, I did, I did like, fuck it, let's just push past and just went beyond it. The game was insane, right? And I, I, I can feel the double-A-ness of it. Because there was many things that was undone, many things that was like felt small, right? Like unfinished. The game felt just unfinished. So that's why it was if it had bigger budget, it would have been AAA, I guess. Equipment, office rent, other expenses. We haven't even talked about taxes yet. Again, huge assumption, but a 30 person dev team isn't particularly big. This relates to the AAA game industry because the size of the teams have gotten so bloated. Blizzard Entertainment recently canned their survival game that was rumored to have over 200 people on it. And that game didn't even come out. Larian Studios, makers of Baldur's Gate 3, have over 450 employees in total. Okay, that's insanity. I didn't know Larian would have that level of, because look, Baldur's Gate, three came out long after Baldur's Gate took them. Obviously they made games in between, but like how, how, how much of them are like, you know, the top of the level games? And they have like 450 employees. Every time I hear this, I'm like, what the fuck Bethesda is doing, man? They, they, why, why can't they have like, now, now they have like three studios, but even those three studios have different roles. One of those studios only for like maintaining Fallout 76 or something. And like other studios is like support or something. Only main studio, like kind of, so 100 people might be actually working on the main game. And people wonder why all the like Starfield on like there are things that just ruins the game and things are shit. Why is that buggy? Yeah, they don't have people to do things. Like why not? You you make uh, tons of money just like expand your studio. Even Ubisoft had like 600, 800, right? Uh, obviously like a live service type activism, you know, Blizzard and things like that just like goes to the, uh, even like total of thousands or something across multiple studios. The idea that, charitably, it costs $45 million a year to operate Larian in general is kind of jaw-dropping and still probably undershooting it. Baldur's Gate 3 is of course an exception, as it was the largest game of the year and considered one of the best games of the decade. But while some AAA studios can get away with this, from software for example due to the extremely cheap cost of Japanese labor in the gaming industry, for the most part it looks like this style of game making has reached a critical mass. On the other side, of the fence, you have the single A space, being the indie developers, solo devs, and teams generally under 10 people. These are a lot closer to passion projects, and while there's a very difficult uphill climb coming, the reward can be magnitudes higher than the risk. You know, on one hand, if a random single dev spends five years of their life making a video game as a hobby, and it ships and nobody buys it, well, you know, it was kind of in their own time, it's whatever, they knew the risk, and at the end of the day, they made themselves a video game that you can say you bought on steam but then sometimes yeah, the, yeah just you know indie or a games kind of like tiptoes between like fan project and like a kind of corporate it's not completely corporate level is it double a triple a can be corporate level like there are like investors and all this shared major companies indie games are not going to be the thing like they can be prop but usually it's not right uh some of the games like uh my summer car is made by just one guy like, how the fuck is that possible? Every time I see the game, I'm like, all these things that are added to it. How the hell just one guy made it? random single dev person makes lethal company which is a lovely thing to look at and show the strength of small developers but that also might make you assume that these are the parts of the plane we need to reinforce then we have the double a industry which many people are championing as the next major wave in gaming middle ground video games games I mean, with teams of around <laughs> 30 to 100 give or take that don't bl that's like saying like yeah, the, the young teenagers are the future, kind of, because they're going to get there. I mean, AA games, if it becomes famous and bigger, will make more money. They will be more ambitious. 
they won't have that much of a corporate pressure that already like established AAA games have, right? That's the thing. When somebody becomes too big, uh, you know, after becoming too big, that they, they have this like all the, like we have to appease the you know appease the investors, right? We have to do this. Like the narrative of game puts aside, right? Like we have this many years, this many time. We have to like, uh, you know, like release in this window. Even if like it's unfinished, you have to release it. All these things, like corporate things get put on top of it. Kind of ruins the game, right? So double A game, if they become big, they become ambitious. Like we need to become even more bigger and to like have ambitious projects, right? And that's why people are hoping like, uh, you know, the Obsidian, even though they are not new, they kind of like, you know, r rose and fell, uh, change stuff and with the outer worlds they were kind of like coming back with the double a now with avowed and things like that they, they who knows they might have more ambition outer worlds 2 might be great Avowed might be great because they want to reach that level that type of way below a hundred million dollars on a marketing budget and aren't working with ips being traded around by mega corporations like a cheap whore the rise of this has been relatively apparent as of recently more and more games look to be utilizing such smaller budgets and squeezing out much higher quality products the issue came down to how you are going to monetize these games for many of them it's a simple 20 to 40 dollar price tag and then you let it be but for some especially 40. without the marketing budget to really pull huge numbers they want to have a longer more sustainable sustainable income stream and that includes things like microtransactions cash shops and so forth the problem is that you still need people working on stuff in order to maintain those cash shops and the ability for microtransactions to work is directly tied to how big your game is while it is true that some games can survive for a good period of time off the back of just a couple big whales for the most part microtransactions might just barely pay for those making the content for the microtransactions. This is very much the case in the AA industry and is not something that needs to be worried about in the AAA industry or the incredibly prestigious quadruple A industry. Apex Legends, despite being a free game, still finds a way to charge the cost of a small car every time they come out with an update. But Apex Legends is a massive game filled with whales, so it works. I can bitch and moan as much as I want. That thing, you know, Apex Legends calling it a game kind of feels like a small it's not just a game it's like a ongoing project or something i don't know like maintained project maybe it's considered you know true quad a or something but that's just weird no there's no quad a but basically something so like uh, you know what is a gensing impact right now you know it has insane amount of like investment they're making somebody told me like every year they're investing this level of money like tons and tons of millions i like what the fuck that's an insane amount of number but you know, it's like uh, you know the microtransactions and, and all the other monies they make. Somehow they can pull business from that. But it's like constantly growing thing. So Apex Legends, things like that, is just like you know online industry mostly, right? This only applies to online things. If you're online at that scale, that's whole other level. There's esports and shit like that. Want about how horrendous the Call of Duty shop is, but it's there because it works. However. We hate all these games. Maybe not literally, but goddamn, do we hate how they run their live services. It feels like we're nothing but just wallets to be opened. So I know it took me a very long time to get to this point, the point of why does Helldivers 2, despite having all of those same qualities and even breaking a major amount of live service conventions, feel like it's such a good live service game. Arguably one of the best ones on the market and does the whole thing so right. Why does this double A bordering on triple A from a team size perspective? Why does this- Yeah, I mean, I, I have this double A, I wouldn't have thought of that. Look at is this Unreal Engine 5? Because one thing I'll notice only that is the only engine that is like friendly enough that like even smaller team can kind of utilize and make things look really insanely good and like mechanics be good. Game pull off what everyone else couldn't in the eyes of the players. Let's get the obvious part out of the way. The game is good. The game is very good. I didn't put shit. Did you just shoot him? I no. uh, could use some Did you have a plan for this? 
The bug What the fuck just happened to you? Did you know you can bleed out in this video game, you dickweed? It cycles between a B and an A plus in almost every single aspect, from gameplay to visuals to art direction and so on. This is the Not hardest the part about stuff. making a game, and yet it is basically the most unimportant part of our whole conversation. Because if the game isn't good, it won't survive as a live service to begin with. I know we can joke and laugh at the current live service games like League of Legends Dead by Daylight and Apex and do the usual smoking duck class classic gif. You're telling me these are good games, Bricky? Yeah, a little bit. Like at minimum, they provide entertainment. Maybe they're not good, but they're very entertaining. We just- Are these the good game? Yes, yes, they are. Th that's basic science. That's statistic. All these people are playing. Th these, these are the biggest number ever. That, it, that itself tells it's a good game. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this level of players, would they? So there you go, it's basic science. It's had a slew of games that were genuinely not good. And as much as you might hate what I just said, there's a difference between these and these. But Helldivers, good. I know it's not a shocking opinion, but Helldivers is good. That's step one. Step two is creating a sandbox that allows for constant updates at a regular cadence. This is all a part of how you run your game and how you allow it to be sold. Creating a new SKU for a game's sales is something that requires a not insubstantial amount of dev time. A SKU in this context is a method of being able to sell an item for a game. On our side, it looks like insert money get thing, but you do need to code that. You need to code that this armor is not allowed into anyone's inventory unless they go through the channels that allow you to purchase credits and then spend credits to unlock it. Helldivers has created a SKU that allows you to purchase- Okay, is this gonna be parody of Bethesda? Because Fallout 76, right? People who didn't even purchase got certain shit. <laughs> People's information got mailed to people because somehow that barrier that there is talk about, just Bricky was talking about, like how you have to code this. I guess they didn't code that. And just like, there you go, anybody can do anything is primarily one thing, which are the new battle passes they call war bonds. What are the things you unlock in war bonds? Armor, weapons, cosmetics, more credits, and boosters. What can you not get with these new war bonds? Stratagems, ship upgrades, new maps, new enemies, and other major game-related options. I don't think Arrowhead will ever attempt to sell these, but if they do, they will need to spend dev money to make a brand new SKU for it. So it does garner a bit of confidence that these are the main things they're looking to sell, and other parts of the gameplay systems, stratagems, maps, enemies are not. But this all comes back to the sandbox of the game. Helldivers, in a crazy way, breaks one of the most important conventions in video game microtransaction law, which is you cannot sell items that give you- By the way, I learned about that game. First of all, I saw the Maxer video about the AI doing that shit, that lawyer thing, right? But it's an actual game, right? And that game is so good that sometimes the judge catches you, like you don't know shit, you're not even paying attention. He just literally asks you, what is the name of the, the guy you're defending? <laughs> it's just, oh my god, that is so good, man. I'm not gonna lie, that, that game sounds so good. Because I'm pretty sure like after sometimes it's like people just like scrolling through mobile, just like pressing buttons, not even paying attention to shit. You any kind of statistical bonus in game. Even if the bonus isn't good, it should not be sold. A lot of games did this back in the day, remembering uh, vividly Advanced Warfare, Mass Effect 3, and Star Wars Battlefront 2. The community, rightly, turned on these ideas pretty quickly, and Mass now Effect it's 3, almost entirely on, cosmetic. So that. why does Helldivers get away with this? The game is co-op PvE and not PvP, which is a massive difference when it comes to this concept. While this isn't an excuse, it does lessen the blow. But also, the sandbox in general makes it so that the difference in items feels like it really just doesn't matter too much. Nobody cares because nobody can tell the difference. You're fighting- Yeah, it's not multiplayer fight to the death with each other type of thing. It's like co-op games, right? Where you play with your friends and just kill, I don't know, computer enemies or something. Yeah, it does change the element. Because otherwise, it's like two teams fighting and one team has like unfair advantage type of shit. In this way, that's not really the case. It's like either you're strong or not, but you're fighting the you know, computer enemy, so it doesn't matter that much. The bots. Whether you use a shotgun, assault rifle, sniper, or grenade launcher, it doesn't really matter because each bot has a specific weakness and the enemies are the same. Does the eruptor in the brand new pass do a great job at killing devastators? Yeah, but the enemy variety is so high that it will naturally be mediocre at some of the other enemies. In this case, hulks and small bots. No gun is statistically better than other guns, 
with a few caveats because no gun can handle every damn enemy. The game balance of Helldivers dictates this. A primary will not kill a Bile Titan, and even if it could, it probably won't kill the tiny hunters running you down as effectively. This is the exact same thing for the armor. In all honesty, the armor in Helldivers kind of sucks balls. The effects it gives you are normally very bad. And so all that matters is the look and speed of it at the end of the day. Grenade's main issue is closing holes. And I mean, you're, you're fighting hordes of like insane enemies, right? Like big arachnids or whatever robots, like your armor is gonna be not gonna be that much of a thing. So it's in the end, yeah, how agile you are. Same with the guns, like you have the most powerful guns, but even that like you're like, fighting the big ass things right so all guns kind of feel the same you have to like have specialities right like which guns is gonna have what damage against what destroying bot factories so there isn't huge variety there either and you can only use one booster at a time the reason hell divers gets away with all of this is because they aren't interesting or different enough to matter in a way i think this is one of my few problems with the game that actually works in their favor armor is samey and unimportant and it almost feels like your primary weapons are too because the game sandbox and enemy variety makes it that way if you entered a bot mission and you were told you are only going to fight the boss with the two sword arms your primary would matter much much more and there would be clear winners but the game isn't like that so nothing is terrible but nothing is really interesting either they can sell in-game power because the real power comes from the stuff they don't sell which brings me to my final and most important point of this entire video and explanation helldivers 2 provides more content for those that don't pay than those that do pay. There is a phrase, I, I, I don't know if it has a name yet, but it's basically the concept of, of a player benefit and a player request. What do you add to the game that is purely for the player's benefit? And what do you add to the game that is you asking for the player's money? So long as A always overtakes B, you will keep your players very happy. Examples of player benefits in other games are releasing new characters, making changes to maps, adding brand new unlocks, new game modes, and so on. Player requests are adding new battle passes, new armor in the rotating shop, skins for your characters, anything that you Small upfront thing. say, this is new content that you need to pay for. In the case of Helldivers, we need to ask, what have they asked of us? An initial price of $40, which should not go unstated, as that is a pretty hefty asking price for a live service game, as most attempt to be free or close to free. The rotating shop with armor sets that isn't too annoying, but present. Then there are currently three total war bonds. Each individual battle pass that you play to unlock all the benefits with a fourth one coming out very soon. What has Helldivers added in terms of pure player benefits? A constant stream of new maps and special effects and conditions on those maps. Brand new game modes to the base defense one and the term aside. Hold up, the maps are changing because I it wasn't like there were only three or four planets, but they're adding things. Th that's insane. Because at first when I saw the game, like, okay, I think to someone like me who just doesn't have that much of patience, I would like the game, but eventually it will get old if you're just playing the same place. New stratagems on a consistent schedule, including the Quasar Cannon, Heavy Machine Gun, and Patriot Mech Suit. Brand new ship upgrades for each of the individual categories. New enemies to fight, including the bot gunships, flying bugs, and fabricator walkers. And this should not go unmentioned as well. An evolving game narrative and major order system, keeping the experience fresh by incentivizing new enemies and maps or players. Right now, Helldivers is in the lead by a solid margin entirely on player benefits. When another game adds player benefits, stapled onto it are always player requests. Here's a brand new character and a brand new map for Overwatch 2, but here's a brand new battle pass you have to go through in order to get part of it. Also, don't forget about the massive store refresh and all the other egregious prices that go with it. Here is a brand new map and gun for your your Apex Legends, as well as a massive battle pass store refresh. And if you don't have the points, you have to grind them out or buy the new legend with your money. Halo has this particularly bad. I like playing Halo Infinite a lot right now. I find logging in for one to two games of big team battle and logging off is just a great way to take it easy. But every time I log in, I see maybe a new map or two every few weeks. But goddamn, you're throwing these battle passes into my face every single time and also telling me how sad it must feel that I didn't buy this armor in time so it just stares at me saying unavailable grayed out 
on my Spartan. Arrowhead have added new content for players at a regular cadence, and they don't need to pay for it. They add new content that other games wish they could add at this speed. When was the last time you saw a game add a new enemy, a completely brand new thing to fight just for the hell of it. When Mass Effect 3 added the collector's faction in the multiplayer, it was fucking wild. And it was also way too hard. Holy shit. Praetorians, please stop. Plus, you can earn super credits in. Oh, okay. So Mass Effect 3 did that in the multiplayer. I think I remember that. Yeah, people talking about like, um, I didn't care about multiplayer back then. But yeah, if you had collectors, right? Collectors themselves in the Mass Effect trilogy were like kind of war po like powerful, right? That was their whole thing. So I'm guessing they didn't balance out things for the multiplayer. Game, is it a lot of credits? Not really, but it definitely softens the blow. See, I'm a full supporter of Arrowhead. I've bought all their war bonds and some of their rotating armor. I have no issues putting my money into this game because it's just that good. But if I was a $40 and done player, I can see how fun this game would continue to be. Not having to spend any money to get the new stratagems, new upgrades, new enemies to fight. And if they play well enough, they might get enough credits to get a new war bond to continue the progression. And if they don't, it will, it just might tempt them. Enough super credits to make that $10 purchase a $5 purchase. And at that point, I can see where temptation can take hold. You can make more money treating your players like players and good will sells. This is especially true when it comes down to the recent debacle we already discussed involving the PSN account for Helldivers 2. Now, Sony might just be extremely excited to ruin my scripts not once, but in fact twice in the exact same video, both adding and then finally pulling this PSN requirement. But when it comes to the topic of goodwill, sometimes the player requests don't always need to be monetary. In our situation here, we as players were able to finally pull one over from Sony and get them to remove their terrible terrible decision. Had they not removed this decision, Helldivers 2 Goodwill would have been in the absolute dumpster. However, even after going back on their idea, there is still a tentative fear surrounding this game. The fact that this was even a consideration. <laughs> that mixed kind of feels strong, isn't it? Like recent, like mostly positive so far, but recent ones are mixed. So like, okay, tide is changing has ruined the goodwill for a large amount of players despite it not going through and despite all of the goodwill that has been provided through the consistent and free updates for the game. Just because you're not asking me to pay anything doesn't mean I need to be happy with what's going on. So while I'm particularly Poor developers, right? Double A, you know, double A style developers with, you know, big ambitions. You can feel it with all the like what, where the priorities are, where the microtransactions are, right? You can feel it like they're trying to do the right thing so they can gain base and like have ambitions in the future. You can expect things like that at like double A type of, uh, you know, developers who's trying to become triple A. Or then Sony just like Hulk Hogan, yeah, that's not gonna work for me, brother. And there you go. It's all to shit now. I'm pretty sure people are gonna be like, gonna remember that. And the problem with today's gaming industry is like, of course there's a problem in gaming industry, but even the people, if they just like, it's like a placebo effect. If they just like expect something bad, they will only see bad, right? So who knows where this is going to turn, right? So far, people love Helldivers too. So I think it's going to like, it's not going to matter that much because people are going to love the game anyway. But I don't know. Really bitter due to the fact that my script has had to be rewritten three times because of this whole thing. I am happy that we as a group won out in the end, but I have a bit more of a suspicious eye going forward. How you spend your goodwill is an art, and I think Sony might be gambling it a bit too frivolously as of late. I do love the game a lot, but like I mentioned well, earlier, the sandbox makes 76. it so that the armor and weapons, the main parts of the game's war bonds, are not different enough to be interesting. Interesting. I know mentioning Destiny in a live service good video is basically blasphemy, but I'm genuinely shocked armor <laughs> color armor shaders like, aren't fuck? a thing that's being sold. A lot of it looks so samey and get like a black and red edge lord look would make me care a lot more about what I wear. I love my Michelin Man armor. It's my favorite armor in the game, and I desperately want to shade it white so I can role play as the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. I'm terrified beyond the capacity for rational thought. I think eventually the players will realize all the war bond stuff doesn't really matter, and they'll need to pivot, not to selling other items, but rather just selling better ones. Getting a bit more creative with it. It's not as fun getting another assault rifle, but if you gave me dual akimbo P90s Modern Warfare 2 style, 
I buy that. If anything, they need to go harder with it. Get some silly banners in the background. Make it like the Black Ops 1 15th Prestige animated call. I think they should like have a temporary team up with Warhammer, right? With Warhammer skins. Where you pretend to be Warhammer. Because it kind of feels like that, right? Like with the scale of the fighting. It would be so awesome that like, you just have Warhammer theme shit. Just like add skins to it, not even that much. Calling card level of stuff. If you want me to be excited about a victory pose, make it fun or funny. Make me jump for joy and then just fucking explode into a shower of gore like in Crab Game. Two, one, go. Two, one. Okay, so he fucked up completely. What the fuck is that? Until that point, however, when Helldivers breaks in terms of general microtransaction law with their selling of in-game stuff, they make up for with a whole bunch of player benefits as opposed to player withdrawals. If you ask yourself, does my experience significantly get better if I spend money on this game compared to not? And if the answer is, only a little bit, then they're doing a fantastic job. I hope other games follow in their footsteps in the future. What we have here is- I mean, look, man, uh, there has to be some advantage to the people who spend money because they are actually spending money, right? If it isn't like, that's not really fair for the people who are actually spending real cash, right? But like, you have to balance it out, like how much of an advantage, right? Is so special and unique, but also respects us to such a degree that if there is any game that could use a copycat, it should be this one. This is a great example of the exception to prove the rule, how the live service rush can be done right if it puts players first. Lots of AAA companies right now with their investor first mindsets can't and won't do. Another score for the independently published company. When you don't have a boardroom of investors breathing down your neck, you're able to make better decisions. As the biggest Mass Effect 3 sympathizer in the world, I must say, despite how terrible its monetization was, what with the day one Javik DLC and the loot boxes and the multiplayer giving you only a percentage chance to- By the way, the Javik DLC was such a bullshit. I mean, Look, when I bought it, I don't know, like, I think it was past the time, right? It's like a few years later I bought it. So I already bought it with the DLC and things. But I didn't realize it's part of DLC. But then later on I realized, like, wait a minute. It's part of DLC. Like, Javik isn't in the main game. You buy it as a DLC. That's so fucked up. He feels so part of the game. It shouldn't have been DLC. It should have been part of the game. That was, like, kind of, like, shady as soon as you realized. Because I, ne I never even thought once that there could be DLC. It just felt part of the game to unlock new stuff, etc, etc. I will say, every single multiplayer DLC in that game was free. They added new maps for free, new weapons for free, new characters for free, new modes for free, new enemies for free, new difficulties for free. Did you need to unlock some of these by buying packs? Absolutely. Was it only a chance to get the new thing? Also, yes. But you could earn packs relatively quickly, and the grind wasn't the worst thing I've ever experienced. So long as you played semi-regularly, the player benefits outweighed the player requests for the most part. I obviously have my major issues with loot boxes and the gambling issues that come with it, but the multiplayer was that good. And it was because we got more than we asked for. A few asterisks. So I say, good on you, Arrowhead. You've done what feels like the impossible, and you've done so without being corporate shitheads. I am a little nervous for the future, and I don't exactly know what to expect from all of that, but I will most likely be here regardless because the game is just that fun. Thank you everyone so much for- Yep, game is looking awesome so far, right? Uh, yeah. <sighs> Helldivers 2 looks in every single way awesome. Look, for me, visuals are kind of important, right? People say, like, mechanics and gameplay is important. Yeah, that is that, but for me, visual is also kind of important. Like, even if something has great mechanics and gameplay, if it doesn't have visual, I'm probably going to have a hard time playing it. Like, I like Morrowind so much. I, I was a kid when I played it. I want to play this right now, but I can't. That's how bad graphics are today. People say, like, it's fine, I can play it. No, I can't. I tried. It's so bad I can't play more of it, right? If they're saying like they might remaster Fallout 3 this year or something, it makes sense after Fallout show. But they have to th if they're going, if they're finally doing remasters, they have to go back to Morrowind or something. But yeah, so far like Hell Devils 2 just looks awesome. When it comes to like microtransaction, right? 
microtransaction is shitty, but then again, if done right, is great for the studio and everything. If people know what they're buying and if like studios profiting, why the fuck not, right? If it's done right. But the loot box thing is so insane. Like you just pay for a box, you don't know what's in it. It's gambling at a whole other level. It's just fucked up, right? If you're paying for something, you know this is the item I'm paying for, that's fine at least. Like you're paying for what you're looking at, right? You can have anger over it, like, okay, the, this is like giving unfair advantage to this and that. But at least you know what you're doing. The loot boxes are just insane. Like, who was the first person who actually like thought of that in video games and implemented? Was it did it start with Mass Effect 3 or something? I don't know. But that's so fucked up. I mean, Mass Effect 3, Bioware, EA kind of makes sense if EA is involved, but who knows? Probably if you like my next subscribe and I'll see you next time.